So recording started. Okay, it's all good. All right. So first thing first, Wednesday. So on Wednesday, because I have a meeting, I have the entire day scheduled for interviewing because the CIS department is hiring two new faculty members, one in uh, cybersecurity and networking and the other one in programming and web. I'm on the committee for the cybersecurity and networking one. So on Wednesday, I have you know, basically interviews the whole day and then half the day on Thursday. So that means um, on Wednesday, I most likely cannot teach this class. Okay, so instead of having you guys to be here, only to find that I'm late, so I'm just I'm not canceling the class. Okay, I'm converting Wednesday's class onto online and, and asynchronous. So I'll have a recording prepared instead of you know, having me actually in the class. But you don't have to come here, so there's no in-person component on Wednesday. Is that okay? All right. So I will try to explain the answer to the solution on Wednesday as well. And obviously the video is not going to be released until after the homework assignment is due. <laughs> yes, I pay attention to those days. So that's Wednesday. Um, for exam two, it is going to happen soon. But since we are not going to have Wednesday, I'm thinking about postponing the review of the questions to next Monday which means the Monday after that is going to be the actual exam. Okay, so let's, let's go to this tool here, okay, because it actually has a calendar too. So let's look, let's look at the calendar and go to, so next Monday, oops. All right, so next Monday is the fourth, and then the Monday after that, is the 11th. So we are talking about the 11th for the second exam of this class. Oh, man, that, mean, that means I have to postpone it all the way to the Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be the Wednesday on the 13th. We'll have exam two for CISP 440. If you're on my Monday, Wednesday assembly language class, it's most likely that exam two would also be on that day. So I'm just gonna cancel it down. There we go. So are we good here? Is that visual enough for people who want to go like, oh, I want everything to be visual. This is the calendar being visualized. Is that okay? So make sure that you, know, you have that day, you know, clear then you know, kind of study for the exam. I cannot believe how many days we are losing you know, because you know, this is a Monday, Wednesday class. The only day that the Tuesday, Thursday class is missing is Thanksgiving. That's it. Ah, okay, well, I can't really change that. So, so let me go back to my notes for today. All right. Turn it back into this orientation. So we got Wednesday and exam two already talked about. So we can now go back to our regularly scheduled program, which is counting. Yes. Uh huh. Small clarification because I think there is like extra parentheses and one person was missing on it. Uh, that's possible. Let me check. Okay. So we are already in propositional logic, and this is the resolution and proof by contradiction, proof by contradiction homework assignment. So oh, okay. in the negation of S T, I think there's an extra parenthesis. Negation of S or negation of T? Yes. Okay. Let me double check. So the quickest way I can check this is to put it into a text editor that has parentheses matching. And the usual mouse pad that I use already has parentheses matching. So let me double check on that. I have no idea where it opened it. Okay, well, that's fine. We, we can always put it into VI2. So let me just stash it into VI somewhere. I'm not sure whether in text mode it can do it. We'll see. Yep. 
Yep, it does. Okay, excellent. All right, so this is, so the open goes all the way to the end, and this one matches this one, and this one matches this one. So I believe there are no extra parentheses or ones that are missing. No. Huh? Right around, around the negative F where it's the parentheses, they overlap, they cover yeah. the exact same thing. You don't need like any Say that one more time? You don't need that set of parentheses. This set? Yeah, it is not needed, but there's no mismatch of parentheses. So, question? So, yeah, so that one was right. I really thought that there was an, a, a sign that didn't make it on the right side. Nope, there's nothing missing. You can also count, right? You know, so you have open, open, close, close. So we are all you know, balanced here. Open, open, close, close. So that's one pair that is still open. Open, open, close, and close, and close. So they should all match up. This reminds me of one of those uh, lead code problems you know, where they want you to process a string to look for mismatching of parentheses and brackets and braces. If you, do, if you have not um, experimented with that one, you know, it's actually a really good one to get started with uh, lead code. Okay, so any additional questions? Nope, that's it, okay. So you are correct, okay? You know, there are, there's a one pair of parentheses that are not needed, namely, you know, this pair and this pair, basically, you just need one of them. Technically, you don't need any one of those because your know, implication has a lower priority compared to or, at least the way we defined it, right? So that means you know, even both of these pairs of parentheses are not needed. But you know, they don't hurt anything, you know, it just you know, make sure that you, know, you group process the disjunction before you process the uh, implication. Alrighty. Any other questions about the homework assignment? Nope. Yep. Is the exam next week? Hmm. How shall I answer that question? Okay, first of all. Um, being on time in class can be helpful. Yes, I have to bring that up. And two, it is the Monday after next Monday. Wednesday. It's the Wednesday, thank you. It's the Wednesday after next Wednesday, thank you. So two weeks from today, the best way to put it is two weeks from today. Is it good? Hmm? Oh, today's a Monday, that's right, okay. Two weeks and two days from today, okay, that's 16 days from today. All right, any other questions? No other questions? All right, so we are gonna get started with, um, we're continuing with uh, the discussion of counting, okay? So we're still counting stuff. So today we are going to uh, I, oh, by the way, I've made some significant changes. I wouldn't say too significant, but I um, asked uh, Chat and GPT to come up with some questions, and it is actually surprisingly good <laughs> because you know this is the topic that we'll be talking about today: the UI notation versus the Omega I notation. And they ask you know, about the recursive definition and which one, how are they different conceptually from each other? And it answers the question actually correctly. Yeah, I was actually surprised, okay, you know, to tell you the truth, I was actually surprised that ChatGPT was able to understand, you know, which one is for, you know, how they're different. Um, so that's where we're going to start today. Has anyone used the same kind of prompt, you know, for your other classes and try to upload, like, the content from your other classes and see if ChatGPT can give you some practice questions? Nobody. Okay. Physics, okay, and what class uh, did you apply that to? Just program, okay, cool. Um, I think this is a very interesting you know, tool for studying. Oh, one more thing before I start on today's class, okay, because you know, uh, I actually asked you know, ChatGPT, you know, how to study and have a deep understanding of course concepts, and it gave me a pretty good answer, okay. So this is a whole conversation 
um, you might want to just kind of, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you might want to read like from the beginning to the end. Now, if you're handling this class for CISP 310, like the breeze, okay, then you probably don't need that. On the other hand, if you are going like, hmm, I can probably learn a few things that might be useful, then you can read the entire thing. It just brings you to ChatGPT. You do not need to have an account you know, with ChatGPT to read the whole thing. But it's relatively long, okay, because it gave me uh, the first prompt that I asked was, you know, the differences, the difference between shallow and deep. Okay, this is my question. This is my prompt. Describe the differences between shallow and deep understanding in learning. So it's not only for this class. It is for any class where a deeper understanding is going to be helpful. Okay? Some people do that without even knowing it, okay? But other people may, you know, may go like, huh, okay, this is a different way of looking at things. Um, and then later on, I also ask it for tips because it's not just enough to you know, ask for the differences between the two. So I also ask him, please elaborate on skills, habits, and techniques that enhance a deep understanding in college slash university context, in a college slash university context. Specifically, point out specific note-taking techniques and study skills that help to understand concepts at a deep level. And he gave some pretty interesting notes, okay? Some I did not even think of myself. Uh, you know, uh, skills for deep understanding, critical thinking, active listening, synthesis, and integration. Um, so you can, you can read the rest and you know, But what I did not expect are the note-taking techniques. I know about the Cornell note-taking method, okay? How many people have heard of that? Okay, very good. But I did not know about the, uh, the annotation, uh, no, this one. Conceptual note-taking, split page, you know, style of note-taking. I did not know about it. I think it is more or less a variation of the Cornell note-taking method. Um, it is a little bit simplified compared to the Cornell note-taking method, um, but it is, you know, if you don't know what it is, you can just search for that, right? I mean, it's literally, you just search for it, okay? Highlight this portion, and it says you'll know, search for it. It will, it will give you some examples. Um, so that one you know, took me by surprise because I did not know about these techniques. Um, and then the, you know, later on, I, this is the, uh, an example of a split page format as an HTML document. So I can copy and paste, you know, just copy code and then paste it into an HTML file and then just you know, open it from the browser and it'll give you a view of what it means by you know, split page. I, I really think it's a, just a variation on Cornell note taking. So anyway, um, that's what I can do with um, OpenAI, you know, ChatGPT. I suspect you can do the same thing or very similar with the other two main AI engines. Uh, one is called um, Claude, and then the other, one, the other one is Gemini. I believe you know, both of those can give you very similar you know, responses. So that can be helpful, okay? You know, I just wanted to give you guys some example of, you know, what I would consider to be somewhat useful ways of utilizing your know, chat GPT. Anyway, so what we're going to talk about today is how do we compute the permutation outcome set of experiments without replacement, okay? And then later on, we'll talk about combination outcome set as well. All right, so the first question is, what do I mean by permutation outcome set? So this is where I'm going to use my little tablet today. Okay, I probably need to put it on the desk, you know, because otherwise my handwriting can be too squiggly. Okay, so the question is, if I have you know elements like you know A, B, and C in a set, and I want to count generate um, you know, choose two out of three list all permutations. So how would I go about doing that? Well, first of all, do you know the answer by hand? I think I have done this one quite a few times already. So what that is really asking is I got three items in a bag, okay? And I need to take two of those items out of the bag, but the ordering is important. In other words, which one I took out first and which one I took out second 
is actually significant. Is that okay? So the way we work on this, okay, you know, this is why you know, you know, this is helpful, because one way to visualize this is to use a tree. Okay? So this is the starting point, and from the first trial, I have two, I have three possible things that can happen. I could have chosen A in my first trial, I could have chosen B in my second first trial, I could have chosen C in my first trial. So there are three ways to proceed in the first trial. Does that make sense? In my second trial, what can possibly happen? If I have chosen A already, then the second trial can only either be a C or be a B or a C. If I chose B in the first trial, then the second trial only has A and C to consider. Oops, here we go. If I chose C to begin with, then I only have B and C to consider in my second trial. Is that okay? Now, because you know, the question said, you know, choose two out of three, so now the question is, what are my tuples? Because every time when you're looking at permutation, where the ordering is important, each outcome of the experiment is a tuple, because a tuple is where the ordering is important. So this one has A, B, this one is A, C as a tuple, B, A, and then B, C. So you can now see how A, B, and BA are considered two distinct outcomes because the orderings are different, okay? Because in the first one, I chose A first. In the second one, I chose B first. So now with this, with this one is CB, and then we have, oh, okay, never mind. This is a bit of the CA. <clears throat> there we go. So we got six of these. So the earlier um, lectures related to this particular module focuses on counting, which is, oh, there are six of them. But now we are actually interested in, tell me exactly what six tuples we are dealing with here. So this is how we can visualize how we can come up with a set. Is that okay? So when we look at omega, okay, so omega, which is the, the symbol for the outcome set for the entire experiment. So in this case, it is simply the union or I should say, you know, it is simply you know, the um, B C. Then we have C B and C A. That is my omega. Is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, what I'm trying to express here? Which is basically how do I come up with the set of all outcomes from an experiment? where the trials are without replacement, you know, whatever I choose out of the bag, I, can, I don't put it back into the bag, and ordering is important. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. So now the, the question is, how do I do this programmatically? In other words, you know, how do I write code to do this? So are we good with this? Can I switch back to the slide? This is all getting recorded, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so let's switch, up, switch back to the slide. So the first thing is, I look at omega zero. Okay, well, first of all, let's define what is omega i of something. So uh, t of i is, okay, so we'll let t represent the pool of choices originally presented. In the example that we just saw earlier, T would be the set with A, B, and C in it, because those are the items in the bag to begin with. Is that okay? All right, so T is a set. It is re representing all the choices that we have to begin with. And then we'll let T, uh, omega I of T to represent the outcome set of an experiment involving I trials. So the I is indicating the number of trials, and then T is the set of your know, initial um, trial outcome or trial outcome for the very first trial. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what is omega i of t? t is the items in my bag. i is asking how many items are we taking out of the bag. Is that okay? All right. So the first, you know, if I want to define this recursively, then the base case becomes important. In other words, what if I have a set of key which can be, which doesn't have to be empty, and I am taking nothing out of it? What am I going to end up with? 
In other words, on one hand, I have a tube, okay? Because you know, on, I put, I'm trying to put marbles into the tube where the diameter of the tube is the same as a marble or slightly bigger than a marble. And I got a bunch of marbles in my bag. And I ask, okay, here's an empty tube and here's a bag you know, full of marbles. And I, and I say, what is the outcome if I choose not to take anything out of the bag? You go like, if you think there's no outcome, no, nope, just one outcome. The outcome is I have an empty tube because I did not put anything into the tube itself. So there's one single outcome. Is that okay? Because that part is really important. So the empty tube is expressed as an empty tuple. Think of it as, as an array with nothing inside. There's, there's no element in the array. Is that okay? All right. So doesn't sound very useful. Okay? As a concept, it does not sound very useful. So now, you know, through a recursive definition, now we have this you know, rather kind of obscure looking kind of thing, which is, you know, um, I know that we have T items at this point of the experiment. I still have I trials, you know, after, at this point. How do I come up with the outcome set of all the tuples? So this notation here, okay, let me use a mouse pointer. So this notation looks really difficult to understand, but we just have to do it one step at a time, okay? So what we do is to think of the outer most part. What is the big U with an E under T, you know, E as an element of T under it? In other words, I'm focusing on just this portion. What does that mean? Well, it means you know, we have a gigantic union. Okay, so let me use my tablet to explain that. Right there. Okay, so big U E of t, some kind of function of e, really just translates to, you know, I take one element out of e, uh, out of t, excuse me, and then I perform you know, f of it, you know, perform f as a function, and then I just have a union of all of those things. So it's basically a loop. It is best illustrated using an example. So let's say we are not talking about some you know, abstract t, we are talking about a set that has a, b, and c in it. And then this f of e is still kind of a function. So what this boils down to is f of a union, f of b union, f of c. Yep, there we go. So are we okay with that concept? In other words, we are taking each element out of the set. Apply function f to it take the result of function f and make one gigantic union out of the result of all the applications of function f to all the elements in the set that we are working with. Is that okay? Does it remind you of the sigma notation? Okay, it's one of those quote unquote big notations, you know, where we are simply performing, you know, um, a loop over a certain range of items. Now, sigma typically range over integers or natural numbers. Okay, this one is just ranging over elements in a particular set. Are we still doing okay so far with this? All right, so I'm going to switch back to the notes here. So now we understand you know, what the big U notation is. This portion here is essentially f of e. Okay, so if I were to define f of e, this is it. Okay, so the question is, what is that? Okay, so let me just write it down on my tablet and then we'll take a look at what that really is. So f of e is a set with e in it, Cartesian product with big omega i minus one, T minus the set that only has E in it. Okay, so I can now switch to my tablet. Is it okay for me to switch? Okay. So if you have a device in front of you, you know, sometimes it helps you to have your own device to focus on the, the module text. So this way, when I'm switching between you know, the module text and the tablet or whatever, you know, 
or uh, Joplin, you know, you can still kind of stay focused on the note itself. Okay, there we go. So I'm defining f of e to be e as in, a, in its own set, Cartesian product with big omega, i minus one as a subscript, t minus the set that only has e in it, and then close parenthesis. Okay. So now the question is, what is that? Well, let's work on this one step at a time. We'll focus on this notation here. Okay, you know, braces, you know, surrounding a E. Do we know what that means? It is a set with a, with a single element being whatever this E turns out to be. Is that okay? So E can be whatever, okay? You know, we just make a set out of E with only one single element. It is also called a singleton set because it has one single item in it. Okay. Do we still remember what is Cartesian product? Okay. So now the big question is, what about this thing here? I thought we were defining big omega. How come we're using omega again? Well, there's no problem with using it again as long as it is not big omega of i again. No, it's not big omega of i. It is big omega of i minus 1. So if the original problem given to you is to remove four items, this is a subproblem of only removing three items. But what you can choose from is also not the entire T anymore. It is T minus the set that only has E in it. In other words, everything but E. Is that okay? All right. So this is re a recursive definition because you know, we are basically saying, okay, let's boil this down to you know, big omega of I minus one. Then you try to figure this out. It boils down to its own, you know, big omega i minus two, big omega i minus three, and so on, until we get down to big omega zero of some set. But we know the answer of that one. Then you work your way back up, you know, to reapply to all of these things. Is that okay? Are we are we good? Okay. So in real life, your body looks like is, okay, so let's just say that I got three um, marbles in this bag, okay? And my job is to figure out all the permutations of removing those marbles, like let's say two out of the three marbles out of this bag, okay? That's my that's my problem. T, uh, big omega, uh, two, and then T is A, B, and C. Each one is a marble, okay? So I go like, Ugh, that's kind of, a chore, okay? I know what my choices are, okay? I can remove A first, I can remove B first, I can also remove C first. But what happens after that? I don't want to deal with it, okay? So I'm just going to say, I'm taking A first, okay? You put it into the tube, and then I give, you know, the problem to you, okay? What is left in the bag? I have just removed A from the bag, which originally contained B and C. I only have B and C in the bag, right? So by the time I hand the bag to you, it only has two marbles. But because the entire experiment, experiment from my perspective is to remove two items, I just removed one of the two. So by the time it gets to you, how many items do you have to remove from the bag? There's only one item, right? Because only one out of the two, right? So you go like, okay, fine, you know, tag, you, know, you gave me a bag with only B and C in it, uh, let me go. Okay, it's a B, okay? Then you go like, but I'm not done yet because you're not the end case or the base case of the recursion. So now you hand it to the next you know, recursion or the next invocation. But by the time it gets to you, the bag only has one item in it. But more importantly, how many things do you have to remove from the bag? Zero. Nothing, right? So you just go back and go like, okay, here's an empty tube. And then you have to go like, Okay, so how many ways can I do the Cartesian product with that empty tube? There's only one way, okay? Because you're concatenating with essentially an empty string. Then, then you know, when you're done with that, then, but you still have another ball that you can remove, another marble that you can remove from the bag. So this time you remove C from the bag and then pass it on to the next person again. It's like, okay, now you have a bag that only has B in it. 
uh, but we are not removing anything from the bag because by the time it gets to you, I becomes zero. So you go like, okay, fine, it's easy. Here's an empty tube, back to you. Is that okay? So that's kind of how this all works out, at least you know, in terms of you're know, just talking about it. So now the question is, how do we see it? How do we visualize this whole thing using these particular symbols? So this is how we are going to do this, okay, you know, in terms of actual notation. So I want to, ultimately, I need to figure out what is big omega two, and the original set has A, B, and C in it. Okay, so this is my original problem. So go like, hmm, how do we do this? Well, it's probably best to look up the definition. So if you look up the definition, which is actually in this slide here, um, is, is two non-zero. Because if by the time you get to zero, the answer is easy. But two does not equal to zero, which means I can only use this particular case. Is that okay? So now I have to go back to my note here and go like, okay, so we have one case when um, E, or the one that I remove is A. I have another case here when E is B. And I have another case here where E is C. There are three things that I have the union, or three cases that I have to handle. Does that make sense? From the perspective of the top level application of omega. Okay. So now, if E equals to A, then I apply the equation or the formula, the function that I, you know, that we talked about earlier. So that means now we have to figure out what is the set of A, Cartesian product with big omega one of what is left in the set. Because I removed A, so we only have B and C left this time. Is that okay? So now I have to figure out what is big omega one of BC? Well, but you know, the order of what I, how I do thing, these things is not really that important because I can now just you know, kind of work this out for every single case. So this one has B already removed. So A and C are the only two things left in the set. <clears throat> and then for this one, I have just removed C. So that means I only have A and B left in the set. Oops, curly, no, there we go. Are we good so far? Okay, so this is from the top level perspective. You look at this and go like, okay, so whatever each one is returning, okay? Because this is returning a set. This is returning a set, and so is this one. How do we know each one is returning a set? What is the last operator for each expression? Cartesian product, exactly. And Cartesian product returns a set. Is that okay? All right. So now we look at this and go like, okay, then what do we do? Well, I mean, I think I have enough space to look at what is big omega one of BC, okay? So now we have a subproblem of what is big omega one, okay, maybe I should put it here. So cross that out. Okay, there's a way, yep, there we go. So now we try to figure out what is big omega one of BC. Well, in this case, it is not big omega zero of something, so I cannot just go like, oh, this is, this is the answer. I, don't, I cannot give you the answer right away. So this one has its own iteration. So that it has two iterations because I can now choose a different E to be B, and E can also be a C this time. Is that okay? So is the indentation working? You know, like you're kind of indicating which part is the subproblem or which other part. This thing, these are the three subproblems for the outermost um, big omega. These two are the subproblems of the second level. So now you go like, okay, fine, we're just gonna reapply the, you know, the original thing, you know, how we apply you know, big omega. So this one becomes B as a singleton set, Cartesian product with big omega zero. And the set is, new, is not empty because at this point we would have A and B removed, C is still in the set. 
Is that okay? All right. So now we go like, oh, okay. So that really is the same as asking what is the set of B Cartesian product with a set that has an empty tuple. So technically speaking, this will give us a set of you know B and the empty tuple, like so. But you know we collapse all the tuples, so now it becomes okay. So I need a little bit more space here. So this only becomes a tuple with just B in it. Are we doing okay so far with that little corner of derivation? I'll give you guys a, a moment to kind of absorb this. Okay, all right. So what I'm really asking is about the derivation from here to here. First of all, do we do we understand why big omega zero of the set with only with C in it boils down to a set if with an empty tuple? Yeah, well that's the, because that's the base case. That's how the base case is actually defined up here. Okay, so now we look at that and then we go back to the next step, which is you know, what if the Cartesian product between a set that has B in it and another set that only has an empty tuple in it. Technically speaking, the empty tuple is also an element, it's also a value. So with hierarchy, then we have a two tuple where B is the first item and the empty tuple, the entire thing, is the second item. But because you know, we don't need structure in this case, so we collapse the entire thing into just a tuple with B in it. Is that last part understood? So now you go like, oh, okay. So that means you know, when equal when B equals to C, then we just end up with a set with C in it. With a, we end up with a set with a tuple, and C is the only thing inside the tuple. So this is the answer to the case up here. This is the answer to the case up here. Is that okay? Which means Omega one of BC, okay, omega one of BC is really just boil, boiling down to a set with a tuple with just B in it and a tuple with just C in it. Is that part okay? Because because I'm making a union between the set with just a tuple with B in it and also the set with only a tuple with C in it. So these two are unioned together because of the big union notation. In other words, I take these two, make a union out of it, and that union, okay, points, points, it becomes this thing here. Is that part okay? Give you guys a moment to kind of think about this. <clears throat> Good. All right. <clears throat> so just out of this part here, so what are we doing with this particular set here, which is you know the answer to big omega one of B C? Oh, we have to Cartesian product that with a set of A. Okay. So that means you know the entire thing. Okay. So that means this entire thing is going to be A B as a two tuple. A, C as a two tuple as a set. That is the answer of the Cartesian product. Is that okay? So one step at a time, right? You know, we go all the way down to the uh, big omega zero. So we end, up, we end up with a we end up with a empty tuple here, which is Cartesian product with this B over here which then give us a tuple with B as the first item and the empty tuple as the second item, which then collapses into a tuple with just B in it. Similarly, we end up with a tuple with just C in it, and that itself is also in a set. These two sets are unioned together to become the set with two single tuple or uh, singleton tuples in it. One is B, 
in the, as a, in the tuple when it's C in the tuple. That is big omega one of the set BC. This set in return is Cartesian product with this A over here, which ends up with AB as a two tuple and AC as a two tuple in this entire set. All of this is when E equals to A from the perspective of big omega two. Is that part okay? I'll be making all the connections. Okay, all right. So can anyone guess what this is going to translate to? The structure is still the same. The only difference is we took B out first and then we only have A and C left for our big omega one. So the structure is still the same. So we end up with B Cartesian product with a set that has A in, a, in its own tuple, C is in its own tuple, which then becomes a set with B A in a tuple, B C in a tuple, like that. And then this last one, kind of the same deal, okay? So we, so I'm skipping you know, one one step here. So now we have C A as a two tuple, and then C B as also a two tuple. So what do we do with all of these sets? Okay, you know, I'm talking about this one, this one, and also this one. Another union. So let me use arrows to tell you which one is going into this big union. These three are going into this big union. So what do we end up with? Oh, well, just the six items that we saw earlier, okay? So this will give you the end result of AB, AC, BA, BC, CA, CB, CB, close curly brace, that's it. So that is the final answer. This is the answer to that question. All right, so I'm gonna pause a little bit here, okay? Because if this is a little bit, can't be seen as a little bit complicated because I spelled out all the details. So I'm gonna see if you guys have any questions. It does. So it has to do with you know, how we look at something that looks like this. Okay. So let me let me let me make it more clear because you know it's not easy to see what we are talking about. So we are talking about the tuple where the first item is a non-empty tuple, the second item is an empty tuple except. So the question is, how do we look at this? Now we can look at this just the way it is presented here. It has a structure. So that means if we look at it this way then you know, we, we basically end up with something that looks like this you know, for the first question. But when you look at the ordering of what we really care about, which is the ordering between the A and the B, all we need to know is A is first and then B is second. So that's why you know, in the context of what we are dealing with here, this is considered to be the same as just AB as its own two tuple. So basically we're collapsing all the structure within a tuple and look at a tuple of a tuple as if it is just a tuple. We, we take all the items you know, out of the embedded tuple and then just add it to the outer tuple without the structure. You have to use an empty tuple and not an not a set. Okay, let me let me go back to because I, I know what your question is, but I need to make sure the whole class understands. So you're talking about whether this should be an empty to a set with an empty tuple, or whether it is an empty set, right? So the question is the answer is it cannot be an empty set 
Because if you make a Cartesian product with an empty set, you end up with an empty set. So we need an empty tuple to give it something to make a tuple out of. And an empty tuple is, okay, it's not nothing, and yet it contains nothing. So let me elaborate on what I just said. An empty tuple is not nothing, and yet it contains nothing. This is not philosophy. This is not poetry. This is just discrete structure. What did I just say? An empty tuple contains empty. It contains nothing, and yet it is not nothing itself. Think of a bucket that you buy from Ace Hardware that has nothing in it. Okay, so the question is, is the bucket itself nothing? Can you just take the bucket out of Ace Hardware without paying for it? The answer is no. <laughs> you have to pay for it. It is something. And yet, when you, you empty the bucket and when you put it upside down, nothing is going to come out of it because the bucket itself contains nothing. The bucket is not nothing, and yet it contains nothing. Are we good so far? Yes? Okay. But you're correct. This, that is the reason why big omega zero of t needs to be a set that contains the empty tuple, because if it contained nothing, if this were the empty set, this entire thing was the empty, empty set, then the Cartesian product would end up with nothing as well. All right. So are we doing okay so far? I don't even know how to ask questions about these yet. <laughs> I suppose I can ask you like intermediate steps in between the derivation. Okay, let me ask you a different question. Based on these definitions, okay, this is the base case and this is the recursive case, can we turn this into actual code? And what would we take? to turn this into actual code, okay? And this is the big difference between this class being taught by a computer science person versus a math person. A math person would not have cared about the actual implementation, but a computer science person would look at this and go like, hmm, let me see how I can do this in, you know, as, a, as a program, okay? So let's look at each item and ask ourselves, okay, do we know how to implement this? So we'll look, we'll look at this one first, which is basically just a function that takes two parameters. This is one parameter, okay? The number of trials left is one parameter. It is just an unsigned integer. Oh, we need to represent a set in this particular program. So do we know how to represent a set in a programming language that you know? Okay, you guys can tell me, okay? Mm -hmm. because. Uh, you have taken CISB 430, 400, and so on. Did they talk about the representation of a set in those classes? No. Okay. <laughs> so that means you, know, you need to you know, either implement the concept of a set yourselves, or you have to use a template class in C. There is such a thing in, you know, as a template class in C and C++, not in C++, not plain C. So if you look up your know, template class set in C++, you know, that will give you, I'm looking for the best you know, way to explain it. So this is a template class which requires you to tell it what kind of data item is in the set. Well, what do you think of, what, what do you think you know, would be the item in the set that we're dealing with here. I'll, I'll kind of flash back to my note here, okay, you know, to the previous page. So what kind of set are we dealing with here? Mm, it's actually not easy, right? Because you know, we can have a set that only has a single element, which can be, you can look at it as a char if you want to. But at the same time, we can also have a set 
of tuples, which are arrays of chars in this case, or vectors of chars. So now the question is, how do we perform you know, multiple, uh, the Cartesian product? So you have to define the Cartesian product, okay? The best way to define you know, the Cartesian product in the case that you know, on one side you have a set, on the other side you also have a set, is to over, okay, is it override? Overload the multiplication operator. So when you have two sets and we use the multiplication operator in between, then you can interpret it as, oh, you want the Cartesian product between these two sets. The outcome of Cartesian product is guaranteed to be a set of vectors. So yes, so the answer is yes. You, you know, based on you know, just based on the uh, the knowledge of a template class set in C you can do this. Okay, as long as I can tell you the original set is a set of chars, you can just work with that, and you know, the rest you know are not too difficult to follow. Is that okay? All right. What about union? How do we perform a union when you are given two sets? Well, I believe that is part of the method of a set class. So I don't know for sure, but we'll take a look. Okay. So we got insert. Okay, I need to find the template class. There we go. I think this is the best place to look up. And then we just need to look up the methods contained within this class. Member types, member functions, we got iterators, modifiers, observers, operations. I do not see union in it. Let me just make sure I don't miss anything. Nope, union is not in it. What are you gonna do? So now we have a template class of set and it does not have union in it. So what do you do? If you need it, it's not here, you just have to implement it. So you have to extend the template class set of whatever, okay, make, it, make your class also a template class so that you can use the same parameter, your param parameter you know, for the, the, the type that is inside the angle bracket, and then you have to define your own union okay so okay that takes care of union what else what else do we need so we have union and then we have cartesian product okay so how do you implement cartesian product on one side of the cartesian product you have a set of chars on the other side you have a set of vector of chars right so do you know how to create a set of vectors that actually implements Cartesian product. It's a loop, right? You know, it's a, it's a loop. In, in this case, you know, the one, the one thing on one side, you know, on the left-hand side is guaranteed to be singleton anyway. Okay, that makes it really easy to do. Just extend all the tuples on this side by one. Okay, but you have to insert at the front because with tuples, ordering is important. Okay, but I'm pretty sure all of you know how to take a vector and say, okay, the first element cannot be this vector here. It's just the extra thing that has to be the first one and then append the rest, you know, of the other vector as part of this vector here. So, yeah, so you can do that. And then what else do we need to do? The next item is recursion. Okay, you, in other words, you have this function that has a parameter of two, and then the next time you call it, you have to reduce it by one. Oh, one more thing. Um, if I go back to the original description here, can we implement subtraction of a set if it is not a part of the original set template? So let's take a look. Do we have difference as a, as a method here? I don't think it is. I don't think it is there, so you just have to implement it. Do we know how to implement subtraction? You are given a set, you're given two sets, sorry, I take it back. You're given set A, you're given set B, and we want the result to be everything in A but not in B. Do we know how to do that? 
as long as you have a way to match, it's like, okay, I, I took this out of B, is that in A or not? As long as that answer, that question can be answered, you can implement the rest. So if you're using C and C++, there's a way, there are ways to go, okay, you know, to get this to work. On the other hand, if you're using JavaScript, you're better off. <laughs> because in JavaScript, um, a lot of the operations that we need to perform, like union, is already here. And to find out whether something is in a set or not is also here, it is called has. In other words, has is implementing element of. It confirms whether something is an element or not in a set. But it has limitations because this has can only work with simple values. If you have a set of tuples, it doesn't really know how to deal with the tuples. Okay, if you, it will only match two tuples if they are exactly the same. In other words, they occupy the same addresses in address space. Otherwise, it does not know structurally how to match two tuples or vectors or arrays as elements inside a set. So what do you do in that case? Extend what is already given to you and implement your own has function you know, in your own class so that you can actually take into consideration are we dealing with elements? Are we dealing with an element that is a set or a list or you know, array or a singleton value. So you basically have to throw in some elbow grease to implement and extend the functionality of a set. Is that okay so far? Okay. So the idea is, yes, you can do all of this. I should go back to the definition here. You can do all of this in C++ or just about any programming that you want to use. The only question is how much additional work do you need to do in addition to what is already built in or supported built into the set. Are we doing okay so far? All right. <clears throat> Shall we move on to the next topic or are there additional questions about this one? Okay, all right. So the next one is talking about the outcome set in terms of combination instead of instead of permutation. So in this case, I'm using you know, the big U, you know, U as a symbol here. So UI of X is representing the set of all possible combination outcomes of an experiment. We have I as the number of trials and it's X as the original set. So once again, we are looking at a bag with marbles, okay? But this time, I'm not taking the marble and putting it into a tube where ordering is important. I'm taking items out of this bag to put it into another bag where ordering is not important, okay? So the question is, what do we do? Well, we always deal with the simpler, you know, the simple question first. What if you have a, you know, a bag of marbles and then an empty bag where you are supposed to put all the marbles into, okay, the ones that you have taken out of this bag, you put it into the other bag. And I'm asking you to take nothing out of the original bag to put it into the new bag, okay? So the, quest, the first question is, how many outcomes are we talking about? Let me repeat a question. We have a bag potentially with a bunch of marbles, and we have a new bag that is you know, initially empty. I'm asking you to remove nothing out of this bag, which has all the marbles, into this new bag here. How many outcomes are we talking about? One outcome, because this bag is empty. Okay, The empty bag is an outcome. So this goes back to the empty bag contains nothing, but yet it is not nothing. Is that okay? So the empty set inside the set here is taking the place of the empty tuple. It is a container that has nothing inside, but that becomes the empty container itself is an outcome. And that's why it is in the set corresponding to um, the outcome set of combinations of removing nothing out of the original set. 
Is that, a part, is that part okay? The base case is always the most important one because as simple as it is, the big question is why do we have a non-empty set as the result of this operation? And the only item in the non-empty set is by itself an empty set. So once you understand that particular question, then the rest is, I mean, the sim, I mean, the op, the expression looks more, much more complicated than it has to be. But the question is, do we understand the base case? Okay, you're getting the base case. Okay. So what if i is not um, zero? I should have said greater than or equal to one. So for any i that is greater than or equal to one, the following recursive definition applies. All right, so look at this mess here. So this is a big mess, okay, because we have two big U notation here. The outer big U notation is simply saying for every element in this original X, do something to generate a set. And then take all of those sets and big, make a big U and out of those. Kind of the same thing that we were doing, okay? So from the uh, loop perspective, this, this big U notation is the same as the other big U notation. So now the big, the really bigger question is, what about this big U notation here? So this bigger U notation looks super confusing because we are looking at the outcome of U of I minus one and say for every element in this big U of I minus one, do the following. In other words, u of i minus 1 is giving us a set of sets. Let me say that one more time, okay? This u i of x is always returning a set of sets. Or potentially one set, because here u0 is going to return a set of an empty set. But nonetheless, the items inside or whatever is returning from the u something of x is a set of some sets, okay? You know, it could be just a singular one. So what do we do with that? Well, we say for each set as an element returned by u of i minus one, blah, 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 perform this operation. So this operation is giving us a set where we union you know, this s here, which is coming out of here, with a set, a singleton set with just E in it. This E is coming out of this E over here. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. From the operational perspective, okay, if I were to give you an example, how do you work with this? Okay, so I'm just gonna copy this to my tablet here. So give me a moment here. So this time I'm gonna work with you of the set of A, B, C, and D. All right, so let me switch back to the tablet. Okay, so this is the problem. If I were to give you this problem and I ask you to do this by hand and show all the steps, what would you do? You go like, okay, we have to, okay, first of all, is two zero, because you know, if two is zero, or if the subscript is a zero, we are done. I am just gonna give you a set with an empty set in it, woohoo, we are done. Nope, it's not, that is not to be the easy one, because two does not equal to zero. So that means the, from this perspective, we have a loop that has to go through each and every element in the set of A, B, C, D. Is that okay? So that means you know, I have to figure out the case. What if E equals to A, and then I leave a lot of space here because all the other ones are very similar, okay? E equals to C, E equals to D. There are four iterations in this outer loop. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, for each case, you know, the, the rest of the complicated expression will give me a set so that I can have a union for all of these cases. Is that okay? Okay, all right. So we'll just take a look at what happens when E equals to A. So now we, what we are doing is the other part of the expression. 
which is the big U, okay? And this time we have uppercase S because it is a set. As an element of big U as a notation, you know, of, as a function name, this time it is U1 of whatever is left, okay? Since A is already chosen, I cannot choose A again. So that means at this point, I only have B, C, and D left as things in the, mar in the bag. These are the only three marbles left in the bag because I already chose A as a marble out of the original bag. So for these, um, we have to generate an expression that is a set that has E in it, okay? In this case, it's A. And then we have to union this with whatever S is. So this is the next item that we have to figure out. You look at this item and go like, hmm, I think the first thing we need to figure out is what is S, okay? Because S is referenced here. So in order to perform this union, we better figure out what S is. But S is also mentioned here. It is just an element of big U1 of BCD. So that's what we need to figure out next, okay? It's basically, okay, so I'm, I'll, I'll put this on a different page. So this time our big, our new problem is this. Okay, so we look at this and go like, darn it, one does not equal zero. I cannot use my super simple answer to the question. Well, it's okay. We just have to kind of look at this and go like, fine, you know, we have to think of what if E equals to B, what if E equals to C, and what if E equals to D, okay? I leave a lot of space in between because I, all I really need is a lot of space for the case when E equals to B because these two are very similar to this one. So once we figure out how to deal with this one, eh, the rest is not hard. So now we look at this and go like, okay, when E equals to B, what we are really asking is what is the big union where S is an element of U zero this time of the set that contains C and D in it. And then for each element S in U0 of blah, 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 we are going to generate this expression, which is you know, um, element E, which is B in this case, unioned with whatever S we choose out of that set. Is that okay? Because if this, is just a temp this is just me replicating the template, but instantiating you know, the actual values over here. Are we good so far? Does everybody understand why we started with B, C, D here? Once we have chosen B, then we only have C and D left. And then also, you know, if originally we have one trial left, then we now have zero trials left. Is that okay? So in this case, we go like, but wait, we know the answer to this question because U zero of whatever is going to be a set with the empty set in it. We get so far? Well, how do we know it? Well, it's part of the definition. It's part of this definition here. I don't even care what X is in this case. X may be an empty set. X may have a bazillion items. I don't care, okay? It is not important. So now, if I go back to this example here, then we go like, okay, we know how to answer this question. So S is in a set that has the empty set in it. Is that good? Okay, so now we go like, oh, the rest we just kind of copy and paste. We go like this and go like, wait, that means we only have one iteration because there's only one item in the set where S can be coming out of, okay? So this whole thing becomes, oh, it just boils down to um, the set that contains B unioned with the element inside this set over here. So which is just the empty set. Can someone tell me the answer to this question? What is the union between a set that contains B and a set that contains the empty, uh, the empty set? Uh, not the set that contains the empty set, the empty set itself. So what is the union between these two? It's just B itself, okay? It's just the set that contains B, okay? So this becomes just this here, okay, cool. So we have just answered the question of when E equals to B, the answer is B. So when E equals to C, I think you know, it is okay to, 
just kind of shortcut the whole thing. And you mentioned that these three will be the answers to the question for each iteration of this loop. Tell me again what we are supposed to do with the result from each iteration. It has something to do with uh, the big U notation. We're supposed to make a union out of those, right? So we go like, okay, fine. You know, big union here, okay. These are all sets. They can all be union together. So the union between all of these is just D, C, D as a result. Are we good so far? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So now we go back to the previous page and say, oh, okay, we know the answer to this question here. So this whole thing, so this becomes you know, for every S in a set that has, oh, I think I might have, okay. I think I messed up my notation. I apologize. I think I messed up my, uh, my uh, notations because there's supposed to be an extra pair of braces here. I forgot. Okay, my fault, my fault. Okay, so uh, there's an extra brace pair of brace here, which means the answer are these, which also means the ultimate answer to this question is we have a set where it contains three sets. We have a single, we have a singleton set of B, a singleton set of C, and a singleton of set of D. So I did not actually copy my equation, my own equation correctly, because I forgot the outer braces in the original equation. So let me just double check. This outermost your braces is actually mentioned in the original thing being the uh, outer brace here. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay, I do apologize that I forgot about the outermost your braces. The reason why I found that I have a problem, that I forgot something, is the union out of this thing here is supposed to be unioned with something else. And you, can, you cannot union B with something else because B itself is not a set. So the only thing you can make a union out of would be you know, two sets. So that's why you know, I've detected this problem. It's like syntax error in my head going like, no, this does not make sense. So are we, are we okay with this outcome? Okay. So now that we go back to the previous slide, we go like, okay, we have B in a set, C in a set, and then D also in a set. And then once again, I forgot the outer brace. There's supposed to be outer braces here. So this time we are looking at A unioned with whatever S is, and then there's an outer brace over the entire thing here. All right, so this time we got three iterations. You know, this big U has three iterations. The first iteration has D, the second iteration has C in the set, the third iteration has D in the set. So that means this boils down to the set of B union with, um, oops, I take it back. A union B as a set, and then A union with C, and then the set with A union with D in the set. Is that okay? So this becomes the set of AB in a set. This becomes the set with BC in a set, this ends up with AD in a set. Is that okay? I'm just going to pause here. Yep. The middle one is BAC. Huh? Uh, the middle one? The middle one is, is AC. AC. You're correct. Correct. 
There we go. All right, so what do we do with these three? In other words, what are we doing with AB in a set that is also in a set, AC in a set that is also in a set, and AD in a set that is also in a set? Each one of these is the answer to this particular question. So what do we do with all the answers to these questions for each element in this whole thing here? We union all of them together. Okay, so let's do that. So big union again. Take these three in. And what do we get? All right, so. Well, we have A, B, A, B in a set. We have A, C in a set. And then we have A, D in a set. And they are now all members of the same set. Is that okay? Okay, so do we agree that these are the things going into the union? Yes. yes. Okay. So that means AB as a, in a set is a potential member of the union, of the result of the union. AC in a set is a potential member of the union. And then AD in a set is a potential member of this union. Well, guess what? They are all members of this union because in order to have a union, um, the member of the result of the union has to be found in at least one of the constituents of the union. And all of these are found over here. So I did not miss you know, a pair of phrases in this case. Is that okay? All right? Are we, are we good with this page? Because you know, if, we're, if we're good with this page, I'm gonna backtrack again to the previous page. Are we good? All right, so now we go back right to this page. Oops. Oh. Okay, this is actually, I don't have any page to go back to. So what if E equals to B? What, is, what do you think is the outcome of this one? You go like, oh, okay. I think I have a pretty good guess of this. So this means here we have B A in a set, B uh, C in a set, and also B D in the set, and each set is a member of that overall set. And in this one, oh, I, th I think I see the pattern. CA in the set, uh, okay, CB in the set, and then, um, oh, okay. let me, let me re re rewrite this, okay. So CB in a set, and then CD, in the set, and then the last one is going to be DA in the set, DB in the set, and DC in the set. And then we take these three and then make a union out of it. That becomes the final answer. But because we're making a union, what do you think is the actual answer? You look at all the things that can potentially go into the union, you go like, wait, uh, we are not going to have nine items out of this because some of these are actually the same thing. Because BD and DD as a set are really the same thing because ordering does not mean anything in a set. Okay? You look at BA, well, that's a set, but it is the same as, well, we don't have AB here. What do we want? Oh, right here, yes. So we have AB and BA being the same set. So we so after we take care of all the duplicates, what do we have left? We have A B. Okay, so I'm just gonna mark the ones that I have taken care of. So that's this one and mm -hmm. also B A. We have A C, which is here, but it's also here. We have A D, which is here, but it is also here. And then we have BC, which is here, but it is also here. And then we have BD, which is here, but also here. And then finally, we have CD, which is here and also here. That becomes the final answer.
Is that okay? All right. So recursion is messy if you are to do it by hand, <coughs> because the key to recursion is to understand what is the base case, and to understand the non-base case, the recursive definition. But if you are to do it by hand, <coughs> it's still doable. It's it's just awfully messy. Are we okay so far? We are running out of time today, so I'll give you a homework assignment so that you can do it by hand. So let's try a U3 of the following set of A, B, and C. <coughs> and don't, don't screen out your, your answer because I, I, I think some of you already know what the answer is. But try to do it by hand and then you go like, you're gonna come to that conclusion, it's like, that's, <laughs> but, yep. Oh, the last problem? Okay, let me go back to that slide. Oh, okay. It is this one. This is the answer to that question. Say again. They're not canceled. It's just that there are duplicate elements within the things that we have the union. Because <coughs> in the union, ordering does not matter. So AB is was contributed by the U. Um, it was contributed by U one. Okay, of whatever. So, but AB is the same as BA, so it can only be counted as one AB in the, in the result. So the big, so the big difference between the big U and the big omega, you think, is you know, in one case we are Cartesian product, using Cartesian product, which means you know, you're always generating new things. The other one is using a union, which means ordering is not important, and that's why we can fold things together at the end. So when you look at the last, the one that I want you guys to work on, which is this one here, you know, the, it's, a, it's a trick question, okay? You know, because if you already know what it means, okay, if you look at the meaning of what this is asking you, the answer is like that, okay? But procedurally, it is still, you know, if you follow all the steps, it's still a mess, but it should still give you the same answer as conceptually what you think it should be, okay? so. Work on this one, you know, and then on Wednesday, you know, we'll, I'll give you a you know, lecture that is online because I, I'll be in interviews on that day. All right. So I'll see you guys next Wednesday because next Monday is a holiday. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to stop the recorder and then I can answer questions.